We're living in a universe filled with atoms, and some of them have nuclei that are stable while others undergo something called decay. How can we, as chemistry students, predict whether or not a specific nucleus is going to remain stable or undergo one of those decay processes? That's the goal of this video. We're gonna take a look at nuclear stability, what makes a nucleus consistent and well-built as opposed to those that are more fragile and likely to fall apart. Thanks for joining me for this session. And in order to get ready, let's put away our cell phones and other distractions and really dedicate five to 10 minutes to understanding this topic together. What's up, everybody? Welcome to Neil's Not So Boring World of Chemistry. Let's go into the lab and take a deep look. If we're going to arrive at an understanding of what makes a nucleus more or less stable, we have to have some grasp on what a nucleus actually is. It turns out that a nucleus is a collection of two different types of particles. The first of those is known as the proton. Protons have a positive charge. The second type of particle found in a nucleus is the neutron, and neutrons have no electrical charge whatsoever. These are the only things that are found in the nucleus. So in fact, a nucleus is a collection of densely packed protons and neutrons bunched together. One of the more fascinating things to consider about nuclear structure is what is it that actually keeps these protons and neutrons bound to one another? You see, if we focus our attention on the protons first, we would all agree that they all have a positive charge. And Coulomb's law explains that particles with like or similar electrical charges repel one another. So in other words, this proton and this proton, they're pushing away from each other. They don't want to be close neighbors. Now when it comes to the neutrons, they don't have any electrical charge at all. No charge means no force of attraction or repulsion. So it's as if these neutrons don't really even know that they're close to one another. But we need a reason, we need an explanation for why all these particles, when collected, will stick together. It turns out that when you have a collection of protons and neutrons in extremely close proximity to one another, there is a force known as the strong nuclear force that acts to hold these particles together. It's strong enough to overcome the repulsive force between the protons. But this strong nuclear force only acts at really small distances. We're gonna to need to keep this in mind when we move on to the next part of the video, which is starting to try to understand why some nuclei are so incapable of staying bound together. Okay, so hopefully now we have a better understanding of what a nucleus is and what's keeping it together. But we've yet to answer our question, which is why are some isotopes stable while others are more likely to decay? Let's look at some data together and see if we can learn anything from this graph. Now, as you can see on the x-axis, we have atomic number or the number of protons. And that's plotted against the y-axis, which is the number of neutrons. Now, every dot, every little mark you see on this graph represents an isotope that's stable. In other words, the nucleus is not going to decay. You'll also see that there's a solid line, and that line represents a ratio of one proton to one neutron. Now, interestingly, for smaller atoms, in other words, atoms with low atomic numbers, actually between about 1 and 20, we see that the number of protons to neutrons, when we compare them, it's about a 1 to 1 ratio. In other words, those dots are very close to the solid line. But what do you notice as you move further to the right on the x-axis? It turns out that as the number of protons increases, we need even more neutrons in the nucleus to keep the nucleus stable. So as we follow the atomic number from left to right, we notice that the dots start to stray above the solid line. 
So what can we take away from this graph? So it turns out in order to judge whether a nucleus is going to be stable or not, we need to consider two factors. The first thing we should do is take a look at the atomic number. It turns out that if the atom in question has an atomic number between 1 and about 20, the ideal ratio of protons to neutrons for stability is about 1 to 1. So if, let's say, an atom has 10 protons, it should have about 10 neutrons, and that would result in a nucleus that's stable. But if the atom in question has an atomic number that's greater than 20, we need extra neutrons to keep that nucleus together. And mathematically, the ratio ends up being about 1 to 1.5. So for every proton, you would need about 1.5 neutrons. So if we had, let's say, 30 protons in the nucleus, we would need about 45 neutrons in order to create a stable nucleus that won't decay. OK, so now we're ready to wrap up the lesson. I want to take a look at some specific isotopes. And let's see if we can use the pattern we saw in the graph to make a definite decision about whether or not these isotopes will be stable or radioactive. So first up, we have oxygen 18. Now I've written it two ways. Here we have the isotopic notation, which shows you the mass number and the atomic number. And this is more of a long form where we just see the name of the element and the mass number. Now, if we wanted to know how many protons oxygen 18 has, if we weren't given this, we could always use our periodic table and look up the atomic number there. Now, what I need to do is first evaluate how big is this nucleus? We know that if it's a smaller nucleus with an atomic number of between 1 and 20, the ratio should be about 1 to 1 for stability. So as you can see, because oxygen has an atomic number of 8, meaning 8 protons in the nucleus, we want to see whether or not this meets, qualifies for stability based on the ratio of being 1 to 1 in terms of protons to neutrons. Now we know oxygen has 8 protons, but how many neutrons does it have? We have to do some simple math to figure that out. In other words, we need to subtract our number of protons from the mass number. So by doing that, we see that this oxygen isotope has 10 neutrons. Now it has 8 protons. So ask yourself, does this particular isotope meet the 1 to 1 ratio required for stability? And the answer is no, it doesn't. Now that just means that this isotope is likely to undergo radioactive decay because the ratio of protons to neutrons is not one to one and therefore the nucleus will not be stable. So now let's try an example with a bigger atom. Lead has 82 protons and this particular isotope, lead 204, has 122 neutrons. Now again, we can figure that out by subtracting our atomic number from our mass number. So again, we have 122 neutrons compared to 82 protons. Now because this is a larger atom, we want to see whether or not it meets the 1 to 1.5 ratio required for stability. Now looking at these numbers, it's not immediately obvious to me whether or not that's true. So I'm just going to use my calculator and I'm going to take 82 and multiply it by 1.5, and I get 123. So a ratio of 1 to 1.5 would mean having 82 protons and 123 neutrons. Now, while this isn't exactly 123, it's very, very close. So in this case, I would judge this isotope of lead, lead 204, to be stable because its ratio of protons to neutrons is extremely close to the desired 1 to 1.5 ratio that we saw when we looked at our graph. Okay, it's time for a practice question to see how well this video worked as far as getting you guys closer to understanding isotope stability. So this question asks you, which of the following isotopes is most likely to undergo nuclear decay? So think that over and try to come up with the best possible answer and then continue watching the video to see my solution. 
Okay, hopefully you selected D, iron 52. Now let's talk a little bit about the phrasing of the question. When they ask which is most likely to undergo nuclear decay, they're basically saying which of these isotopes is unstable. Now we can take that a step further. Unstable would mean that the ratio of protons to neutrons is not ideal. So what we need to consider here is what size nuclei are we dealing with and should they be abiding by the 1 to 1 ratio or 1 to 1.5 ratio? And once we have that figured out, we can look at the actual numbers. So if we look at letter A, carbon 12, you can see that in green I've explained that it has six protons and six neutrons. That's a one to one ratio. And because carbon is a smaller atom with an atomic number that's below 20, this is gonna to lead to stability. So I'm not gonna pick A. Now for the next three choices, B, C, and D, all three of these elements, tin, bromine, and iron, have nuclei with more than 20 protons. So we're really going to now be looking for that 1 to 1.5 ratio. For tin 125, it has 50 protons. If we subtract 50 from 125, we see that it has 75 neutrons, and 50 to 75 is 1 to 1.5. So tin 125 should be pretty stable. Bromine has 35 protons according to the periodic table. If you subtract that from 88, you'll see that this isotope has 53 neutrons. That again is really close to 1 to 1.5, so I'm thinking letter C is stable as well. Now when we get to iron 52, this is very easily confused, and a lot of people won't pick this, because when they break down the proton to neutron ratio, they'll see 26 to 26, which is 1 to 1, and we forget that 1 to 1 is only a good ratio if it's a smaller atom. Now iron, while not being huge, does have more than 20 protons. It has an atomic number of 26. So it's going to need more than one neutron per proton. And um, this is not the 1 to 1.5 ratio, right? It doesn't meet that. It's 1 to 1. So iron 52 is most likely to be unstable, and therefore it will probably decay. And that's our answer. All right, everybody, I hope this video was super useful to you. Thank you for watching. I hope uh, if you want to see more content like this, you'll like the video and subscribe to the channel. If you have questions, leave them below, and I'll try to get back to you as soon as possible with a clear and coherent answer. Thanks again, and have a great day.